Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Barry Mazer. He's going to talk about his efforts to find a forgotten soul singer, Little Miss Cornshucks. The story of Little Miss Cornshucks and my involvement in it is one of the ones that I'm proudest of because it's something that made a difference, that I know made a difference. How did I get into this? Well, I'm the kind of person who doesn't let things go like you are. You know, if I hear come across a reference, I say, what you, what's that? Where did that come from? What do they mean by that? And in her case, nobody was talking about this artist called Little Miss Cornshucks at any length. But I kept cutting, I kept stumbling into the name in other things I was looking into and reading. You'd be looking into some R&B artist who became big in the 50s, and they said, everybody was there. Little Miss Cornshucks was there. Jazz people said, I said, who the heck is that? There's no records. It's that, that there's no nothing. So who is that? So I started, it started in the 90s, early 90s, I think. I just started along the way. And I had taken a hiatus from writing about music professionally. This just got to be sort of a personal obsession. <laughs> like, who the heck is this person? And I would look for where it was. And you got to remember, to take you back to those dark ages 25 years ago, when you wanted to look something up, there is no Google. There is no deep online databases. It means you go to the reader's guide to periodical literature from every year and see if there were mentions in any newspaper or magazine article anywhere. These was all handwork and legwork in those days. It was called reporting and, and or history. So I started to amass these things. I got a friend, one of the writers I had a friend is Nadine Cahotis, who wrote the book on the history of chess records. Well, getting to the Little Miss Cornshuck's records, I knew by now she had been a recording artist at one point, was one of the things I was doing. I knew geek record collectors from all kinds of different walks of old 78s and things. And I started to collect Miss Coinshuck 78s. They were from the late 40s. They're all different labels, all different things. They're generally entirely forgotten by everybody. And she did near the end. Her last recording was one album with Chess Records in 1960. She was a little bit past it, but by a series of circumstances, there's this one Chess Record. That almost held people back from knowing who she was because the info on it was wrong. <laughs> if you tried to track that down. So I had called Nadine Cahotis because she'd done all this research on chess. I said, did you cross paths with anybody who knew, who knew anything about this? And she had even gone on to it. It was too obscure a chess record. She had a whole label history to write. But she knew I was interested. And uh, I'm writing for No Depression and some time's going by and I've got this assortment of records. They're all... And, and by the way, to remember when this was, it meant... People made copies of them and sent me cassette tapes of these 78s they had is how I had them. And, and I got a, a used copy of the, of, of the Chess LP, which is still sitting here, quite messy, but I have that. And uh, Nadine calls me. She said, she, she called me. That's right. She said, she said, Barry, I was just um, visiting the last living dancer from the Club de Lisa. The Club de Lisa was Chicago's, Chicago's equivalent of the Apollo Theater. It was a, it was, but it was also, it was, in a, it was a nightclub set up. A, the Cotton Club would be more like it, only even less like legit. It was a club. Everybody went there, set up. Somebody said it was the kind of place where you could get anything. If you understand what I'm saying, that might be hookers and blow, you know. <laughs> but it was like, and they had these great dancers. It was this great place. Everybody, famous people went there, white and black, boxers, show business people, all these people went there. And uh, Nadine is looking at the scrapbook of this chorus girl who was uh, named uh, Eloise Hughes. And there's pictures of her in very skimpy wear from the, from, from, from the brown skin chorus line like the Cotton Club from the 40s. And she said, she's got pictures of Little Miss Cornshops in her scrapbook. You want to talk to her? I said, oh, yes, I'd like to do that. So 
Eloise became my friend. She soon became my wife's friend because she called at all hours of the day and night with like one more story, one more story. And she would call me and she, we, I started to get stories of the actual person. And uh, one of the reasons nobody had the corn shucks stories, it said her real name was Mildred Jarman, and she was from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Well, she had briefly lived there. People where you come from will be glad to know. She was originally from a, a real, he was born Mildred Cummings. She came from a family of sisters of kids who were singing gospel and pop in Dayton, Ohio. She Grew up and married a guy from Indianapolis, which is why the family is really in Indiana to this day, if, once, if you happen to know who they were, which they didn't know. She felt so herself, so put upon and misused by the record industry in her experience that none of it didn't want to talk. What's more, on the record, Jim O'Neill, who was, who was one of the good music historians and record producers too, had gotten the word that she had died in 1985. Well, I found out very quick, quickly, talking even to Eloise, that that was not true. In fact, she had been alive when I started looking for her. But she was dead when I started being up by, by this point, because she, in fact, died in 1999, forgotten. Eloise started to tell me about different people who knew her, and I would talk to them people who were in the live music vaudeville circuit with her, who'd done, traveled with her. But now I had her real name. So while she was get, telling me the names of people, I started looking, and I realized the real places were Dayton or Indianapolis. And I started going through the phone book and just simply calling every single family named Jordan. Anybody named, it's not that common a name. I called everybody in Ohio, wasn't getting me there. Indianapolis did, and I eventually hit a kid who's, and I'm asking again and again, and of course they're saying, I don't know who that is, I don't know who that is, I don't know who that is. I finally get the kid, high school kid, he says, oh, yeah, she was my aunt. <laughs> really? Um, is there other family there? She says, I, he says, I can't talk about that. Only her daughter, can t- her daughter can talk about that. I said, but you tell her daughter I'd like to speak with her. <laughs> and the family was totally put upon them. You want to talk about people who didn't get paid, labels, record labels who didn't support, people who weren't there for them. That would be the story. But meanwhile... Corn shucks had mattered to so many musicians. This is why I got to be interested. Remember, all these people mentioned her as important to them and like the best one in the club. And like, where did she go? And I came to the conclusion, and I was going to write about it in this context, and I think it's important to understand that people write about the history of American music, whether they're from this country or England or wherever, Germany, Japan, anybody who writes about American music a lot, uh, but especially from here, they wind up falling into the categories that the music business built for them. This doesn't lead to people writing your story. In Cornchuk's case, she came from the era that we call after hours blues, if we call it anything. It was after Billie Holiday's days where people in these nightclubs were singing straight swing, It was before rock and roll, but you're quite in the middle, and you had a generation of singers, and one of the reasons they didn't cover them is because, God forbid, they were women. And the blues historians are not real interested in women playing pianos. They had convinced a whole lot of people it was about rural white guys playing guitars, and it was always more complicated than that, and all the first stars were more in that vaudeville thing. Rural blues happened because they were imitating city blues with the best instruments they could, the best they knew how. You know, Robert Johnson wished he was Bessie Smith. So <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what, but that's not the way people came to understand this because of what mostly white historians did to it. So there was this generation. She was competitive with people like Dinah Washington and little Esther, who was later Esther Phillips. These were pretty big stars for a while there. Among the people who said that they really cared about Little Miss Conchucks was Ahmet Erdogan, 
who would go on to be the co-founder of Atlantic Records and one of the fathers of soul and R&B. And this is the guy who records Ray Charles and Aretha and a few other people you've heard of. And in his memoir, one of those books that brings up Little Miss Cornshucks, he was quite florid about it. He said... I wouldn't be in this business, but he was the Turkish ambassador's son, some people know. It's not for nothing. His name sounds like the current semi-fascist head of the Turkish government. Those were an extended part of his family, a different part. But his father was the ambassador. They were much more progressive people. And he was in Washington, D.C., and discovered he really liked recording black people singing. <laughs> it was, and it was for his own and it was for his own sake at first. He didn't know he was going to start founding record companies. And one of the first he really did this with was Mildred Joyman with Little Miss Cornshucks, and he said, that's why I got in this business. It took a while, but like their dent his dentist gave him and his co-founders of that label a loan, and, and that's how they founded Atlantic Records. And she was gone from she was gone from where he knew her to be. He couldn't find her. And they recorded somebody else covering her very earliest records recorded in Chicago, included her theme song, which was so long. It's nice, I hate to see you go, which was a song that had been around, but she sang it her way. Well, they just took the exact way she recorded it and recorded it with a woman named Ruth Brown, who I spoke to about this. It doesn't even sound like Ruth Brown. Ruth Brown was the first to say, oh, totally ripped that off Miss Cornshucks. It was an exact duplicate of, her, of the way I heard her sing it. And if you've ever heard Atlantic Records called The House That Ruth Built, See, it starts right there with an imitation of coin shucks. They couldn't find her. You know, I eventually met on, on Ahmed Erdogan. He said, you know, we didn't have money for things like looking for somebody. We barely had money. So we recorded that and we got started. He didn't know that Miss Cornshucks went on to record, always briefly, never with any support to speak of, for a whole series of labels. I, meanwhile, had taken all those cassette recordings I had, and I had burned them to this CDR right here. That's the cover. That's a scan of the cover of the LP. And I made this thing, which now had all of the Miss Cornshucks records in one place, sounding pretty good. And uh, when I got, I got in to see Ahmed Erdogan, because my subject, you, know, you couldn't do that very easily. He'd already been head, not only of Atlantic Records, but the entire Warner Electra Asylum <laughs> Enterprise, in the big skyscraper at the Warner Building in New, in New York at Time Warner. And he said, I said, I want to talk to you about Miss Cornshuck. So that was my key in. So I go through these series of rooms and what was at that time Ironically enough, yeah, the, the big video screens outside when you get to three offices, the fourth, the big video screens are, are showing the Warner store at the moment it was a guy named Kid Rock. Yeah, so you finally get into his office, the Chamber of Chambers, and there's memorabilia from Ray and Aretha and souvenirs. Somebody took somebody took like a, a Ray Charles souvenir to the moon that had been on Apollo 11 is there, and 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 his Led Zeppelin and Rolling Stones memorabilia from where, it's all there. And I'm sitting down. I'm going to have me a little talk with Ahmed. <laughs> and and talk about these records, and I play them, and he hears the, the ones that weren't so good. He said, no, nah, they screwed it up. And then I played him the good ones. I played him the recording of Miss Cornshucks with the Benny Carter Orchestra behind him on choral records behind her singing so long again, but especially Try a Little Tenderness, which was the model for both the Sam Cooke and the Aretha Franklin records later. He's just started to of, of try a little tenderness. Yes, the soul version. And Otis Redding, you, everybody's heard at Monterey. That's a direct line back to Miss Cornshucks, the way she sang it. Because what she had done, um, and Ahmed's crying. He said, that's why I got in this business. He didn't know these records existed. She had found a spot exactly between the Billie Holiday kind and even Ethel Waters' earlier versions of Black Lady Singing which was very articulate storytelling diction, et cetera. And you could jazz it, which you could do, but you tended not to. She moved it into the style that was very emotional, which we came to call soul. 
she was singing so. And people started imitating her. Johnny Ray was in those clubs and started imitating her. A woman named Judy Garland saw the way she performed, which was she performed as a country bumpkin. She wore pantaloons and a straw hat and a basket she put down, and they threw money in the basket. And she, she performed it as a country rube lost in the big city. This went over like dynamite in nightclubs in Chicago. All those people in the, in the ghettos were people who either had moved there themselves or their mom and dad did. And there were these memories of that kind of person. And she played it for comedy, like Fanny Bryce or, you know, if any saw, people saw Judy Garland do that kind of stuff in, in A Star is Born, a country stuff, barefoot, or Carol Burnett as the cleaning lady. This is that kind of act. It was comedy. So she was known as a comedian, but who could break your heart. I haven't heard these records I played for him. He hadn't heard put this disc, and he said to me a sentence I never thought I'd hear in this lifetime. He says, this is the guy, the head of an entire mega corporation with recordings, and he says to me, could you burn another one of these for Jerry Wexler? That was a sentence. <laughs> I'm thinking, you can't do that here? And in fact, I did and left it off at the, left it off at the front gate later. But I started to know I had something, and we talked about what it would take to get her done. Well, before he got it out, a French record company picked it up. Meanwhile, I'm in Hoboken, New Jersey, with my, <laughs> with, with my wife, and Peter Blackstock, the editor-in-chief of No Depression, where I'm one of the senior editors by that point, just over 20 years ago, 20 and a half years ago, sees this staying at our house overnight. It was after 9-11. So I would say it was very early 2002. And he sees this other stuff I have on my, on my, on my desk. And he says, what's all that? I said, oh, that's not for you. He said, that you're not, that's got nothing to do with No Depression's idea of roots music, which was pretty much true. But to their credit, I told them the story. And, I, I, you, know, I, I, you know, look what she looked like. She's playing this country meme. It's not what she's singing. This is more sophisticated bl blues and, and soul than that. But, but she's making that happen. He said, well, let me see it when it's out. And I've been pitching that to jazz magazines, didn't take it. And so many I can think we're back to like, who is she? And that's why it interested me. So they said, yes, we have to go with it. And many people will know exactly 20 years ago, as we sit here this month, it appeared as a cover story. In between those leads from Eloise, the stripper dancer from, from Chicago, she calls me one an afternoon and she's like, she came to be talking to my wife just to shoot the breeze. And she called, she was calling all the time. And she called the time and so she said, Barry, and she was talking to my wife, Nina, she said, get Barry. And so I said, you know, okay. She said, Barry, he said, well, you want to talk to Cornchuck's second husband? I said, what second husband? This turned out to be a, a vaudeville dancer. He's even on films. He's in a he's in a movie I saw that traveled with her, and I got that. I got a guy who was managing her briefly, and Dick Gregory at the turn of who who in 1960. So the story had come together, and I got the fact that in fact she hadn't died. She had become somewhat. Disturbed. There were all these stories about her. She'd take that wig that she wore under the country and throw it at people. She, throwed up, she showed up at clubs when other people were singing and just started singing at funerals. All these people told this. Ruth Browning found her later. All these people loved her, but she, in some way she was drinking, and when she would drink, she would kind of lose it. And it got to be debilitating. It didn't help her. And, and, and she went through label after label, and they never kept her for more a single or two. Nobody ever got behind her and backed her. She did, you know, she worked from the, all the way through about 1962 or three, and then just really gave up. She was in clubs. I talked to Clarence G uh, Gatemouth Brown, who I knew for other reasons, who'd been on bills with her. Anyway, the story came together, and I had... What had been on the back of the chess album, about two seconds, two sentences of her life, 
and it was wrong twice, that sentence, to the basically laid out most of the life of Miss Cornchucks. There were things I didn't have quite right, which there was later an obituary of some of her kids that cleared up a few things about marital relations her living kids didn't want to talk about. I mean, they've been divorced, you know, families. They, they told me what they, what they wanted. But because we had these conversations and that story came out, right before the story came out, we met with Cornshuk's daughter, granddaughter, and, and son-in-law with, with us. And they had been, I had to establish a relationship with them. They were totally against having any of this came out. They just felt so screwed over by anybody who'd ever talked to them or did it. And uh, we had this relationship. And by then they met with us and had dinner. And I showed them the article that was going to come out. And they were so up for it. And I just so loved it. And they told me something that broke my heart, which they said in the last days in Indianapolis, she would just sit there and she says, what? and Miss Cornish Mildred would say, why doesn't somebody come looking for me? Why don't they ever ask me about where I've been and what I've done? And I was out there for years trying to get it and with the understanding she was dead and didn't get to them till a year after she died. So that's part of the story. Since then, since then, that article in No Depression went on to Best Music Writing of the Year anthology. A guy in France put out the complete Miss Cornshucks on a label, which you can get. I don't think it sounds as good as this, but they put out a record, finally. And uh, you will now find her. I was asked to do the piece on her in blues and other encyclopedias. She is out there. You will find people say she thinks she gets credited. She became a name to drop. Like Edmund Miller did, you know, if you were like hip, you mentioned Miss Cornshucks and you heard him. I really did get all that started. And it's one of the things I feel best about in life. When No Depression, the magazine came to an end, uh, Peter Blackstock and Grant Alden were interviewed on NPR about what they'd accomplished and what did you care most. And of all those things, they said that little Miss Cornshucks things was the thing they were proud of, which felt pretty good to me too. Because they did, because we accomplished a lot with that magazine and the time. Those of us who I think of as the real people who gave it its reputation made it. And that was good. So today, She's known, and people say she was one of the most influential singers of the 20th century, and um, that's good. I got one coda I want to add to that. One of the things I found out along the way is that at her height, when she was in Los Angeles, singing in the big clubs on, Sa on Central Avenue, in South Central in their heyday, with the biggest people, and a bill with Red Fox, and, you know, I mean, it's in, in, in 19... 48 or so, she got in a movie. It was a B movie called Campus Sleuth, which was a series of movies about the teenagers who would solve crimes. And this was when it got to be called Campus Sleuth. I think they called it uh, Murder on the Beat or something originally. <laughs> in any case, she was in the movie on a hayride and with another black singer, and she recorded, a, she performed a song called Corn Shucks Blues, which was one of her few kind of, ones she was given credit for coming up with. It was in the movie. There were stills of her in the movie, and it was hard to find the movie. I spent years trying to get to see the movie. When, you got, when I got to see the movie, I discovered what happened with that, which was the age of segregation. They would not play that movie as was in the South because she was singing on a hayride with a bunch of white college students. So they had it recorded like happened with black music and white general interest movies in those days. So it was removable. And it could be there some places, not others. As far as I know, an event, and you can buy some cheap copy of Campus Sleuth now, you'll get it. But the fact that she was ever in that hayride scene, which is still there, let alone sang in it, you wouldn't know because it's the deleted version that seems to have survived. So I have been looking still for another 20 years for a copy of her performance captured in that film because she was a visual artist too. I want to see what that looked like. I, I was able to describe that scene because in my endless researches in the Performing Lights Arts Library in New York City, I found somebody from that set's shooting script. 
And the shooting script still had the scene in it, and it had penciled in, she sings Coin Shucks Blues. So I was able to describe what the lost scene was. You know, you don't, if you keep going, you find things. They have stills, they have a color stills, a color of her in it. But um, if it was ever shown intact in, the, in, 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 in northern cities, it may have been very briefly in L.A., but the film archives that have copies don't have that. So this is my last question. If anywhere on the earth you see this YouTube and you know where there's a copy that can be seen of Little Miss Cornshucks performing on video, I'd love to see it. Eventually heard one of the v discs, which was a World War II live recording of her for the armed forces. I've heard that. But I want to see that if it exists. It may not. But that's an artifact of the time she had to work into. I'd be proud to see it. <laughs>